Okay. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, much appreciated. Well, greetings all. Joseph Kursky here. We are going to talk about five forces, five trends, and five skills that I believe are important as you journey forward in your career that uses geospatial technology to some extent. It could be a major part of your your job in the future. It could be a a fairly minor piece, but I think it's going to be important in every single profession going forward because everybody's asking the where question and the whys of where questions are going to be increasingly important because of all the issues and situations and challenges we we have at our communities and our regions and our states and our world, health, natural hazards, energy, water, uh, uh, biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, population change, etc. These are all serious issues. They're all spatial in nature. They all have a pattern, relationships, and trends that can be studied over space and time. And hence, geographic information systems tools are going to be important uh, in the future. They're not going away. People are not going to stop asking the where questions. So again, yeah. it's a great honor to be with you all. And uh, I appreciate the invitation. If there's anything I can do to be of assistance in the future, uh, let me know. Here's one of the things I wanted to plant in your minds right away here, and that is think big, big vision. What do you want to see in society? Sustainable energy, uh, vibrant communities, right? Safe communities, uh, etc. Think of those sort of big vision goals. <clears throat> I just submit to you all that Geospatial technologies is one of those technologies that you can feel good about. It's being used by, you know, your city government, uh, by the EPA, the World Health Organization, the Jane Goodall Elephant Foundation, I mean, the U.S. Geological Survey, et cetera, to build this better future, more resilient future. And so I think it's, it's one of those tools where, you know, you can feel good about it being used for good. And I believe also that You have chosen a great university. I have great respect for the faculty that I know there, and I'm hoping to meet more as we as we journey forward. So I don't intend for this to be the end all be all, and then I'll say, "All right, go map on and uh, live long and prosper," and we won't ever talk again. No, hopefully we'll have a a continued discussion. But um, you students have chosen a great university to study in. Your professors are very forward thinking about GIS in the way that I see the modern GIS platform. And we'll talk more about that, but it is a platform that you can build on. It is not the GIS that we had 5, 10, 15 years ago, or even last year for that matter. It's, it's a platform that people can build on. So it's got field components. It's got coding. It's got spatial analytical tools. It's got a variety of, of data that's increasingly fed by IoT, Internet of Things feeds. It has um, certain workflows that can be modified and adjusted and shared. So the whole platform, I think, is important. Oftentimes, I get people that are good folks, and they, hey, Joseph, I'm teaching GIS, and uh, I'm teaching ArcGIS Pro you know, 2.5. Okay, that's good, but uh, again, the platform is what I want people to embrace, the whole depth of it. Not every single component, because we all have space and time constraints, but immerse, immersing yourself in as many of these pieces as possible. And also the broader uh, immersion of GIS in different departments on the university campus and also in society is another one of the goals that I have on my own team here at uh, ESRI. So, for example, we have uh, the threefold mission, which is education, sustainability, and science. And for those of you students that are thinking about, you know, what kind of organization do you want to work for at some point? Please consider us. We are hiring. We haven't ever reduced staff, again, because people want the tools. They want the applications. They want the the data, et cetera. But these are a threefold mission here. And my team is all about supporting students, faculty, deans, provosts, campus facility managers, campus safety officers, primary and secondary schools, libraries, museums, wherever there's university or education happening from university down to primary school level and also in uh, informal settings, that's where we want to be of support. So consider us as your partner as we as we all journey forward. Uh, another thing that I wanted to share is that, uh, you know, speaking of the career aspect to this, I want you students to think about 
also business partners that we have. We have about 300 business partners. Now, this is uh, one of our business partners. And in here, we have a GeoNet space. It's a community that you can find out more about industry, um, government, nonprofit, academic use of GIS. So it's a, it's a bit geeky, but it's all about geospatial technology. And so I just wanted to scroll he through here because one of the things that I wrote not too long ago, you might be interested in, and that has to do with, um, you can see that the latest things I wrote is all, all about teaching about racial equity and social justice, another pressing issue of our time. How do you do that with GIS and spatial data? So I've got a couple of essays on that, including the policy maps that you might find really intriguing. Uh, another thing that I have though in here is something called Earth Views. And this is one of our business partners. So we have, again, about 300 of these business partners. They're very interesting people. Sometimes there's two or three person uh, company, and sometimes it's hundreds of people in an organization. But this one I think is really fun and interesting. But picture Google Street View, right? We've all seen those. Earth Views, they take images along estuaries, rivers, ponds, lakes, and they sell that data both on the surface and also they have cameras underneath the surface of the water. They sell that data to municipalities who want to understand what their water quality is like in their streams, lakes, ponds, et cetera, in their community. So it's a very specialized market, but Earth Views does exactly that. They started off as fish views being, you know, um, the water theme. Uh, but they've expanded anyway. But you can um, you can explore their uh, resource here in my Earth Views uh, essay not too long ago. And you, they've also got some of these posted online, so you can take your virtual journeys down rivers in Africa and other places around the world that are just absolutely fascinating. So that's a an example of a of a business partner of ours. I think I like to say that because sometimes people cast a very narrow net when they're looking for you know job opportunities with using geospatial, and I I always encourage them to kind of you know, cast it a little wider. And um, the business partners are a, are a good source for that. But also, you know, we definitely need people. We have about six openings right now on our story maps team. Uh, just by the way, this whole presentation that I'm giving today, this is a story map, okay? It's a multimedia interactive web map that probably some of you have used or at least consumed other people's story maps. There are over 1.25 million story maps in existence as of May, 2020. That's pretty impressive. It Sure, of a wide variety of quality. We'll talk about data quality here in a bit. But the fact that there are so many of these show the power of maps and spatial thinking in society. Um, and geotechnologies are going to continue. Uh, it's not going away, as I mentioned. Here's my contact information. Here's a couple of things that I wanted to share with you all. While you're still students, I think it's important to develop your network. I talked about the GeoNet network, but get someone in government, get someone in a private company like me, get someone in academia. Your, your professors could be lifelong collaborators and mentors to you. Find someone in a nonprofit. So develop that professional network. I think you'll find that the geospatial related community and earth, earth related community, geology, geo geography, uh, environmental science, we're all very earth centric, but we also care about people. So you almost never meet anybody in these fields that I'm not gonna share any of my data with you. I'm not gonna you know, share any of my expertise with you. No, they're all very open and hey, we're all in this together. So it's a very wonderful community. And uh, I think you'll, you'll really enjoy your years there. You almost never meet anybody that said, you know those years I was in earth environmental GIS, uh, I hated those years. I'm in something else now. You almost never meet anybody like that because again, I think the community is very nurturing and caring. Now, occasionally people leave ESRI. Sure, it's a big organization. We've got about 6,000 employees, but they almost always go into something related. Like one of our colleagues in the Denver office uh, started his own solar company. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's related enviro something uh, work or mapping something. Um, and here's another thing I want to encourage you to do. We all have a CV or a resume that looks something like this, right? You've got your sort of standard layout. And there's some variability. But I also encourage you to create a story map of your CV or resume. And there's a couple of reasons why. Number one, it's fun. Uh, it's fun. It's your own story. You don't have to do any additional research. It's your own story. 
And so you can put in all kinds of here, normalize your choropleth. Oh, what does that mean? Uh, okay, we'll talk about that. But you can put some nerdy pictures and uh, um, some, you know, practice some of the, number two, it, it helps you practice the story maps tools and they update quarterly. So it gives you good immersion in, okay, next quarter, next semester, um, I'm gonna practice with some new story maps tools. And you can, here's me lying on Colorado. Another thing though, I encourage you to do inside your story map, this is further on down in my story map, I highly encourage you to make at least one interactive web map. That is the power of story maps. A lot of times we see story maps that are only photos and videos and there's no map anywhere. It's not bad, at least they're using the tools, but the, the, the power of story maps is to embed these interactive web maps in. So I encourage you to at least have us have a map or two in there about, hey, you know, I, uh, I taught over here and I had an internship over here and then I went to Georgia Southern and this is what happened after that and so on. And so this is your own story. And the last reason why I encourage you to do this is because your future employer will say, hmm, that person must know something about web GIS tools because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to make this story map. So it's a nice way for you to sort of showcase and you can put some of your projects in here, your portfolio of work that you perhaps have completed at Georgia Southern into your story map. So that's one of the things I wanted to just leave you with today is I highly encourage you to do that. Now, why should you listen to me? Well, I'm not going to bore you to tears with my own background, but I've been really blessed to be in four major sectors of society over the years. So I was president of the National Council for Geographic Education. So I've done work with nonprofits. Uh, as I mentioned right before we sort of had everybody on, I, I love, just like your professors, I love teaching. I love interacting with students. So I every semester teach in at least one university. And I also have had this background in federal agencies. So NOAA, Census Bureau, I worked at the U.S. Geological Survey as well from basically the Cretaceous to the Holocene, a long period of time. A little geo pun for you all. Um, and I love those agencies and still do. Now I'm at ESRI on the education team, which again is supporting universities, schools, community colleges, tribal colleges, anywhere where education happens. We want to be there to support the good work that's going on there. Okay, so we're all about space and place. This is uh, what I've chosen to be the sort of quintessential photograph of the eco region that I'm in right now. It's at the edge of two eco regions, actually, the short grass prairie and the Rocky Mountain Front Range is in the background. And just like Georgia, there's some beautiful places around here that people like to uh, hike, and horseback ride. I'm on my bicycle, but I'm taking pictures of obviously people recreating in different ways. And um, you've got that. Another reason why I included this is because we got the, when we get those big bank clouds that on the lee side of the mountains for the, all of you weather geomorph you know atmospheric uh, weather and climate buffs um, we get that that uh, lenticularis cloud sitting up there for several days it's usually a sign of fair weather and um, so we really enjoy that in the winter time as I'm right here um, you know you're out there in a light jacket when I was a kid I made maps think about the geeky things you did as a kid and embrace those. You might be able to turn that into something that you write about someday or at least something that you're passionate about that you keep pursuing in your career. Now, my, my maps were super geeky. They were on poster board with colored pencil and crayon and you know pen. But in the margins of my maps, what are these? What are these numbers here? They're 3,500 north, 4,200 north. Do we have a chat box here? Yes, we do. See what you think of that. All right, while you're thinking about that, there are address ranges. What kid cares about address ranges? So again, I just ask you to look, you, know, you may like doing some things that none of your colleagues or friends like to do. That's okay. That's okay. Embrace that. That's my word of encouragement to you all. Now, you folks know as well as I do that geotechnologies are incredibly fundamental to learning and also to understanding our planet. Um, and again, my whole goal is to get geoliteracy ramped up in a more significant way in all levels of education and in all disciplines of education. Because I think it's so critical that, that we have to do this to build a more resilient future. You've all seen this 
millions of people look at this per hour, right? This is based on WebGIS technology. It's based on the ArcGIS platform. And the reason why JHU, Johns Hopkins University set this up is because people wanted that data in real time. If there's any one good thing that can come out of this is that, um, you know, one word of encouragement is that a graduate student actually created this. Some of you may know this story with some guidance from that graduate student's professor, for sure. But you can do some really interesting things and some creative things while you're still a graduate student or an undergrad. So that's one of the things I wanted to share. But this is a dashboard, an ArcGIS dashboard. Just like the dashboard in your car, you get a lot of information in a short amount of space. This is a story map that I created on a, on a topic that I'm really passionate about, and that is walkable communities. So I've got a photograph at the beginning of my story map. You can think about whether this is walkable or not. What would you say? And I've got a little bit about what is walkable communities. Why do people care about walkable communities? Inside my story map, I have a survey embedded. Survey one, two, three. Perhaps some of you have used this. If not, I highly encourage you to do it because it's as easy as SurveyMonkey or Google Forms. You're dragging and dropping true, false, Likert scale, multiple choice, et cetera, to, to a web form. You can use Excel for further um, power, but either way, you're getting a simple form. And in my case, it's walkable or not, rate the walkability, tick some choices here, branches, wide sidewalk, dangerous cross traffic. Where is it, which is germane to our discussion today? And then do you have a photograph of it? So in my walkability map, the result of my walkability is this. It's, it's an interactive web map. So in this particular point right here, I actually submitted my own point to my own survey, but uh, here it is. This was while I was teaching uh, down in Australia last fall. Good on you, mate. She'll be right. Anyway, right across from the Sydney Opera House, very walkable park. So I submitted data to my own survey and other people have as well. And at the end of my particular walkability survey, I have what should look pretty familiar to you all. I have a dashboard. The dashboard in this case is coming from my survey. And I've got a couple of pie charts here. You can see roughly two thirds are walkable right now of the 424 with the gauge there, 424 points in my survey right now. And here's my other pie chart with that other attribute from my survey one, two, three. Um, and the legend, a, a interactive web map here where I've changed the base map to one of my favorite ones. I think this is called modern antique. But the point is, this took me about an hour to create this dashboard. We're not talking weeks, months. This story map took me about an hour. The survey took me about an hour to design. The web map took me about an hour. So basically in about a half a day, I created this whole thing. And so can you, you've got the same tools at your fingertips to create these things. And so this is an example. There's another reason why I wanted to show it to you is to one, number one, illustrate that these tools are accessible. Uh, they're powerful. They're oftentimes, oftentimes web-based. Second thing, though, is that um, the power of maps to tell a compelling story. And the third reason why I wanted to show you this is because it connects different parts of this platform, this platform notion of GIS. You know, it's great that you've got music that is not just on your local device anymore, right, folks? You've got music where? Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music, Amazon Music, right? Why? So that you can access... ABBA's greatest hits anywhere, anytime. That was a band, by the way. The point is, you've got reasons for having your music in the cloud. Think of your documents, your spreadsheets. You don't just have stuff on your local device anymore, your laptop, your tablet. You have things in where? Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, etc. right? Why? Because you want to be able to access it at the library, at the university, or at home, or wherever. And you want to collaborate with others, right? You're working on an article or a project with some student colleagues or professors or whoever. You put that there so multiple people can edit it, correct? I just submit to you all, is as great as it is to have your music and your documents up there in the cloud, it's even better to have GIS in the cloud because of several reasons. One, the issues and problems that we talked about earlier uh, do not stop at disciplinary boundaries, correct? They also do not stop at political boundaries, right? They're not just 
Statesboro. They're not just Georgia. They're not just the USA, right? They're, they're global. And they also don't stop at physical boundaries, right? A geologic, uh, surficial geologic unit or a watershed or an eco region. They transcend all those boundaries. So having this collaborative platform that we can share data, methods through algorithms, models, et cetera, um, maps and apps, apps being, for example, story maps, like I'm showing here, is hugely powerful. It's the way that we're going to address these complex spatial issues that increasingly affect our everyday lives. So I, I think that the, the, the platform notion of geospatial technology is incredibly uh, important. Now, as promised, I wanted to submit to you all some things to chew on today revolving around these five forces that I believe are important as we move forward. And as you move forward in your own career or you faculty moving forward in your own uh, faculty uh, journeys. And first of all, geo-awareness. I touched on this a little bit, but people are aware of issues that I talked about earlier. Climate, natural hazards, population change, energy, water, eco-region health, habitat, et cetera, as never before. It used to be the geo-enviro community talking about this. And now, um, in the not too distant past, when I was visiting about 30 or 35 campuses a year, hopefully yours someday, you know, I'd hear this on airport shuttles and in uh, stairwells and in, um, you know, everyday conversation and, you know, coffee shops and student unions and stuff. People are actually aware of these issues now as never before, which translates into very good news for future job growth and demand. And um, that being said, though, I still think, as I'll touch on later, it's still important for you because people don't always make the connection between th those issues and geographic technology. Um, I still think it's important for you to have your elevator speech, your 30 second speech, your one minute, your five minute, your two hour, whatever you've got. Hey, you need to go down the hall and talk to the city manager now. You need to go down and talk to the regional geologist or whoever it is about why your position matters and why we need to fund it another year. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you need to have that. You need to have that there because it doesn't always translate to why we need you. Hey, I've got Google Maps on my phone. Why do we need you, geospatial technology person? So there's still some awareness on that part, but the general awareness of issues confronting our world has, has really never been higher, at least in my career um, and thinking about it. Secondly, geo-enablement. People are enabled to use at least some of these tools that you and I use as geospatial people in some way. It may be finding the coffee shop down the, you know, down the road or finding the library on campus or whatever it is. They're, they're at least enabled to use some of these tools. And then the geotechnologies themselves, having evolved into this cloud-enabled platform, again, is a huge leap forward because it's attracting new people into this field of geospatial technology. And that's good because we need a diversity of people. We need the economists. We need the landscape architects. We need the geologists. We need other people. And in the past, it was sort of, okay, I know you're a city planner, but we need to put your, you need to put your city planning career on hold and become a GIS person for, you know, learn all this stuff. And then two years later, you might be able to go back to your, that was kind of the underlying message is that you had to put your regular career on hold to learn this GIS stuff because it was so cumbersome and all encompassing it was fascinating and nowadays you can keep your regular job and have gis as a tool on your tool belt which i think is a really powerful message i just submit to you all that a few people need to know a lot about geotechnology they need to know about geodesy they need to know about the shape of the earth and map projections and how to build a geo database and and how to geo reference a map and and how to serve up data and into tiles and different formats online and all that all that stuff that is included in uh, geospatial uh, work and the coding that goes behind there. So yeah, learn some Python, for example, use the Jupyter notebooks and, and so on. But I, I also submit to you that a lot of people, I would say everyone in an organization, whether it's a city government or a state geological survey or something like that, uh, everyone needs to know at least a little bit about geospatial technologies because it's a very empowering kind of a tool. It's not just the, oh, you need a map or you need some GIS data. Yeah, go, go down the hall and see those people down there. They're a little geeky and nerdy, but the, go talk to them. They're nice people and they'll help you. It, that's still somewhat of the way organizations work, but more and more, it's, it's more people in an organization have access to these tools because organizations are saying, you know what? This is a valuable asset for our entire organization, not just a few people. 
And then citizen science, it's existed since the 1800s, right? You know, the birding community would go out and they still do, right? You probably know some birders. Uh, the, the feathers, the, the call of the bird, the type of the tree species it's in, the time of year, the time of day, et cetera. Now, citizen science has received a huge boost through geospatial technology because people are saying, oh gosh, I can map all that data now? And coupled with that, organizations, government agencies, for example, they don't have the field staff. They don't have the money to have a field staff uh, out there collecting data on invasive species or uh, I, the, uh, the rock slide that I've heard about over here in this part of the, of the mountains or whatever it is. Uh, the individual people are doing that. And sure, there are data quality issues, but a lot of that data coming in is actually of, of decent quality. And then finally, storytelling with maps. And maps have been used to tell stories for thousands of years. No different now. Whether they were on clay tablets or wood blocks or you know, etched on to silver plates like Aladrisi's map from the 1100s, that would have been fascinating, right? Map on, map on two big silver plates. And more recently on film that was made, uh, that was used to eventually create paper maps and then scanned in the digital form, and then most recently in, in digital form from the beginning. So storytelling with maps has always been important. It's just that now with our digital means of telling stories through these multimedia story maps and other web mapping applications in 2D and 3D has lent uh, this a huge boost. So um, I would also argue that GIS has not only survived a lot of major IT paradigm shifts over the years, it has thrived on those shifts, right? When you think about the mainframe to cloud evolution, uh, it, is, it is, is amazing. And there were some articles 20 years ago, maybe some of the professors that are my age who remember some of these articles, probably you students don't. But anyway, let me just tell you, that said, hey, by 2020, spatial won't be a thing It'll be so embedded in mainstream, you know, IT workflows and, and organizational workflows that it won't be a separate distinct thing. Well, in some ways that's true. I mean, you've got a lot of people in different organizations, for example, your typical city government. It's not just the assessors and the buildings department and the parks and rec and, you know, those folks, um, public works and so on that are, it's, it's all of those and, and more. And that's huge for, let's say your typical city government, because let's say, let's say you've got a place like Atlanta um, and you've got okay. We need to uh, we need to put a, a, a fiber optic cable under that street, so we have to tear it up. And then a month later, oh, uh, that street is scheduled to be ripped up now. Oops. Why don't we do it in reverse? Um, you know. So the point is, you're you're saving a lot of fuel and money and time where you've got workflows that make sense because everybody's operating with the same sort of geotech geo database. So the assessors and the zoning and the planning and the parks and re recreate. You know, it's just. Think about other organizations as well, land management agencies like the Bureau of Land Management or the Georgia DNR, Department of Natural Resources, et cetera. So sure, it's, it's embedded more in workflows in an organization, um, but spatial is still rather special. We have our own ways of thinking about the world, a holistic way where the lithosphere is tied to the hydrosphere, is tied to the atmosphere, is tied to the anthrosphere, the human sphere, uh, is tied to the biosphere, et cetera. So we're thinking holistically. So I just also encourage you students, yeah, have a specialty. It may be soil science or natural hazards or whatever, um, land, land cover, but keep keep the holistic view. We really need that in society. We need people that can look at things in a holistic um, way because these these issues again they don't they don't they're not just focused on one discipline so i would just encourage you not to lose the what i call the geographic framework no matter what discipline you happen to be in the geographic framework is important now in the interest of time and i'm going to paste this into the chat box so you can actually look at this story map um a, a bit more Maybe Dr. Wei could do that uh, because I actually don't see the chat box at the moment. But the point is, um, this story map is available, and I'm going to skip over some sections, but I don't want you to miss some of the things that I'm skipping over. I just have more in here than I have time for because I want you to dig deeper on your own. He'll be emailing me on Saturday night, Joseph, I just found this part on your story map. Cool, I'll say. But 
think about this. Here's a typical, you know, video that I filmed, for example, on a typical university campus. This is one of the indications of GIS uh, trends that I'll talk about in a moment. But think about this. What if from a typical video like this, every single tree species in condition of the pavement, um, invasive species, sign and the condition of the sign, uh, building facade, all of that could be captured with automated uh, methods. And so through uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you're going to get a whole lot of data in this current decade than, that, we, than we, uh, that we never had before. Okay, And that's exciting for a couple of reasons. A, I think the GIS entry-level jobs will radically transform. You don't need to collect every fire hydrant and every rock outcrop in a certain region anymore. You're going to be managing and curating that data and hopefully, I think, doing some more interesting things like analyzing it spatially. You won't need to collect so much anymore. Yeah, you'll need to be critical of data, as I'll talk about in a moment, but that data gathering will be so much more tied to the AI and ML methods that uh, uh, that's pretty transformational. Picture this, you've got people doing this right now. We've got a business partner called RGIS, Augmented Reality GIS. So they basically say, hey, you've got a feature service. It could be even underground. And then you've got an app, the RGIS app, and you're walking around. And of course, a lot of it hinges on the spatial resolution, but you know exactly because of your position here with your mobile device, you know what's underground right there. You don't need to dig, okay, there's the, there's the water main. Okay, so that's another example of you know the 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 fuel time etc uh, savings that can that can be realized through these methods. So building on that, I think that you know the artificial intelligence and machine learning is one of the five key trends that you need to think about as we move forward. And just like any list, the five coolest places to visit in Georgia before you die, the five coolest bands of all time, right? They're all debatable and we could have a discussion about this. This might not be your list or maybe some of you faculty would disagree with this and that's fine. This is what I just wanted to submit for us to chew on today. First of all, that artificial intelligence and machine learning, transforming GIS. Skipping to the top though, we live in a 3D world and it makes sense that we've got 3D analytics. Now we've had 3D visualizations for 20 years, right? In fact, in our old style GIS courses, the end thing in the GIS 101 course typically was like fly through your data. Ooh, right? That was a big deal back then because graphics cards were pretty clunky and, and it, was a, it was a hard thing to fly through your, navigate through your data. But uh, 3D analytics is, is not just for terrain, right? It, You've got data on, I don't know, median age, median income, or uh, some other yeah. variables, and you want to map it in 3D so that you can understand it better. So we've got a 3D scene viewer. I'm getting some some uh, conversation, but oh, well, no worries. We've got some 3D um, analytics now that are making GIS a lot more powerful. Also, I, I would just encourage you folks. Shows in Atlanta. Oops. I would just encourage you folks to... Um, don't do it but just because the tools a, are there. Be a show anyway. Do it if it adds value, okay? Huh? Yes, we all experiment with yeah. tools from time to but time because when it comes to drama, hey, it's way deeper than um, drama because people are dying. They're, they're <laughs> um, engaging and we want to learn more. Great, nothing wrong with that. But your advisors probably tell you this as well, students, but don't just do, attach yourself to a tool just because right. it exists. <clears throat> Accesses, access it and use it if it adds value to your understanding of whatever phenomenon or issue you're, you're grappling with. BIM CAD GIS, um, uh, uh, the uh, engineering and architectural uh, construction community, computer aided design and drafting, the building information management community. You know, those folks were really good about mapping things that were interior spaces for years, okay? And the GIS people were always good about mapping exterior spaces like this landscape behind me, uh, watersheds, eco-regions, population, uh, census yeah, tracts, etc. But now we're starting yeah. to see with the joining, so, uh, at least in part of these communities, uh, really powerful Besides. solutions. So for example, let's say your typical semester when all of you are on campus, what if some sort of weather event happens on a, on a Friday at 2 p.m.? Where are the students? Where are the faculty? Where are the emergency exit? Where's the emergency shelters? And if we had the, the, the exterior spaces mapped in a campus infrastructure kind of a GIS and the interior spaces mapped in 2D and 3D, then we'd be able to have some sort of a plan. And it changes every semester, right? So it, has to, it can't be on paper. It's gotta be in a digital multimedia format. It's interactive. Um, so 2 p.m. on a Friday this semester is different from 2 p.m., right, because the classroom configurations are all different. So that's really powerful to be able to have these communities start talking with each other. 
And then also, as you've seen in ArcGIS Online, let's say you, you're in ArcGIS Online, and um, we'll, we'll turn off this layer that I was going to show you. Uh, um, um, uh, in a moment, we'll turn that back on. But let's say you're here and you say, well, you know what? I want to map some, some uh, uh, wildfires. Okay, so we, we go to ArcGIS Online, and it's important to know where these layers came from. Even though it's super easy to add, just like I'm doing here, uh, these layers. Okay, where did the data come from? Who created it? How often was it updated? Uh, and so on and so forth. So if I, if I scroll out to this landscape behind me, which is actually right here, I'm standing on this point right here, taking the photo, and this area behind me is this. It was the That's Pine the Belt Fire. So that whole ridge was on fire for most of August. Again, this, these, these issues are, are pretty relevant to our society, right? We're about and to get our laundry that, done, but it's not open. Is there any way we can mute everyone? Anyway, um, having that perimeter is not just valuable for people saying, hey, do I need to evacuate? But what about the actual firefighters themselves, right? On the ground, how do we keep them safe and so on? And where are the, maybe another layer to add would be real-time weather, right? Where's the wind going to, what's the wind predicted to be like in an hour? Now, having this at our fingertips is just hugely powerful. Um, fortunately, nobody actually lived up there on that ridge. Um, there were some some land holdings that got pretty scorched, but um, fortunately no structures or no nobody was, a, you know, lives endangered. Unlike some of the other ones, right, that uh, are closer to you all and closer to uh, California and so on. But having this at our fingertips is really powerful. But also as we have this add button at our fingertips, and for example, the living atlas layers, there's 8,500 layers in there. That is sort of a subset of the grander GIS data infrastructure that's out there with open data policies and things like ArcGIS Hub and other ways of serving data, there is no shortage of data. Sure, you might have to collect the water quality in the in the in the wetland down this down the road from your school, okay, from your university. You might have to collect that, but there's so much that's there. Then how do we sort it and how do we know if it's any good? Well, I know this sounds super boring, but it's really important to our times. I have this data blog called the Spatial Reserves Data Blog, and maybe we could put that in the chat. Spatial Reserves. Take a look at this, if you could. It has updates every week. So first we wrote this book called the GIS Guide to Public Domain, Domain Data, which I know sounds a little bit dry, but it's really important to our data-saturated big data world. And every week, my colleague and I write essays about location privacy, where to find data, how do I know if data is any good, how do I assess it, and so on. So let me just show you a fun example from the last um, a couple weeks ago that I wrote. Again, just encouraging people to be critical of data, especially mapped data, because mapped data tends to look authoritative, right? You can make some really nice looking maps without a lot of metadata in it, right? So you don't know where exactly it came from. So here's a couple of fun examples for you to sort of think about. George Mason University, hmm, simple Chinese fast food chain. Interesting. I thought it was a major research university. It's also got a rating. Does that rating mean that's uh, for the university or for the simple Chinese fast food chain? Here's another one that uh, I found in the catalog. I've, I've heard of continental drift, plate tectonics. This is, uh, this is not good, though. This is not good. Orientation matters. So I finally wrote to this catalog and said, you really need to fix this. And they did. Here's another one, data feeds, okay? I know it gets hot in Texas and in Georgia. This is really hot. And look at the uh, precipitation rate. This is like Noah's Ark. This is like the flood, okay? <laughs> also look at the humidity. It's way off the scale. And the only thing that's normal is the pressure. The wind speed is really high too. Ooh, 255 miles an hour. That's, that's pretty windy. But for a year, this, this weather feed was like this. So I finally screen captured it before it uh, was corrected. But even data feeds could be an error. So be critical of data. Don't just accept it because it's a map or a data feed. Understand the scale and the source and so on. Last piece here, this is not a map related one, but it's passed off as an album. It's really just a, a playlist, but notice the errors in it. Hey, I thought it was a pretty big Beatles fan, but Penny Lance, A Day in the Sky. I've never heard of those songs. Hmm. Be critical of the data, okay? 
those are some fun examples. Let me let me cancel a couple of these uh, tabs so we can conserve on our bandwidth. Okay, another thing that I wanted to show you here is at your fingertips, you've got things like this. So if I go to map notes and I'm gonna zoom to my map notes and I'm gonna scroll down here to you all. And my hypothesis is that since you've got a university community down there, that the median age is going to be less. And it is, okay, so I've got the median age, again, be critical of the data. It comes from the American Community Survey. I used to work at the Census Bureau, as you know. And even if you didn't work there, you know that the, the census is not completely 100% accurate. This is the American Community Survey. So it's a, it's a statistically derived sampling of the population. It's not from the 2020 uh, decennial census, which is not perfect either. Uh, some, some countries don't even have a census. So then how do we generate estimates for those countries, et cetera? But here we've got, at our fingertips, we always have to say, according to this data set, according to this data set, it looks like the neighborhoods around you are younger, which makes sense, right? It confirms my hypothesis. And if I scroll down here, I've got uh, about 100 variables at my fingertips. The median age in this particular neighborhood is only 18. So it's probably all the dorms, right? The point is, maps are powerful. That sometimes they, they confirm our preconceived notion of how the world works with certain variables, and sometimes they shatter or challenge the way that we think the world works or is. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I love maps. Let me just have a moment. Ah, what's not to love? Maps are powerful, and being able to do this at multiple scales is incredibly powerful, right? I can map multiple variables if I wanted to, not just a single variable. So coming back to our discussion here, this whole idea of real-time data. So I, I put in the wildfires, I could put in um, current weather conditions, et cetera, stream gauging stations and other things that are coming from this variable sources with different time periods, but being able to pull that in and then start to map it and analyze it. The reason why I say analyze is because of the following. Sometimes people say, hey, Joseph, I mapped my data and here, check it, check it out. And I'll say, great. And? The reason why I say and is because I salute their efforts, but the map is not the end goal. The goal is to understand something in a deeper, richer way, right? You wanna get your data onto maps, sure, but just like R statistics, uh, GIS and other tools, you're using those to solve a problem or to understand things better. You've got a greater goal, okay? Not just mapping things. So I want you to think about that. And then finally, enterprise and web GIS. This is my notion of, that I described earlier with the whole idea of lots of people in an organization being empowered to use GIS and actually being given the tools to do so. So that's uh, pretty exciting, I think. Let me, let me share a couple of other things with you. Here's a serious issue that has affected many families, uh, mine included, and maybe yours as well. Um, or people you know, but uh, traffic accidents, very serious issue in communities. So in the past, this is a story map on traffic accidents, as you can see. In the past, this is the kind of thing that we could do with geospatial technology. We could map traffic accidents, for example, with symbology like this. Okay, we can change it to map the day of the week or the number of injuries or something like that. But uh, it was by and large replicating what we could actually do years ago with just paper maps and doing it in a digital way. But now, we're, I think, in phase two of GIS, not just sort of doing digitally what we could do with paper in the past, but we can take things to new levels for new insights. So for example, we can generate these, uh, these hexagons on, on a set of data and aggregate things into hexagons and then move it into a 3D environment so that we can do this kind of thing where we can say, okay, for this traffic accident data and given my limited time and budget and, and resource, staff resources, I only have the, the time and money and staff to concentrate on just the consistent hotspots in accidents. And so again, yeah, in our you know, ideal world, we'd address every single problem but the reality is these tools are helping us to focus on, in this case, okay, if, if, if every year we can re reduce just the ones in these consecutive hotspots, we could save numerous lives. So again, GIS being used for good, 
uh, in this case about traffic accidents. And as you can see, this is a coastal county in Florida, just to the south of you all. But uh, the exciting thing is that um, we're using geospatial technologies uh, in powerful ways with these different maps and graphs and 2D and 3D. So I'm pretty excited about all this. Now I mentioned that you, I recommend that you have your elevator speech down. On my Our Earth YouTube channel, I do have actual, I know this is pretty nerdy, I do have actual elevator speeches filmed in actual elevators. So feel free to use those for some inspiration, but don't torture yourself. You don't need to look at very many of these. Here's another thing I wanted to share with you all. What is this? Old Macintosh? It's an old Mac. Yep. Excellent. It's an old Mac computer. It's now a doorstop in an actual high school. But at one time, it was a treasured piece of someone's IT infrastructure. And sure, the, the, most of the things that you have nowadays are too light to be a, uh, a doorstop, and they might be a paperweight. The point I'm making here is don't get too attached to the tools. ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Insights, ArcGIS Online, um, R Statistics, um, Story Maps, and other web mapping applications. They're, they're good tools for sure, but the tools evolve, the data evolves, right? The methods evolve. Um, some of the issues though will remain. And so this is the tool that I really want you to nurture as you go forward. This tool here, your brain is the most important tool to think spatially. You're framing the questions, you're, you're being insightful, you're asking, um, you know, pertinent uh, questions about issues, you know, so, so don't neglect that. Keep the, keep the lifelong learning going and don't get too attached to tools. You know, I was showing you ArcGIS online here, you know, at, at, at the end of the year, you're going to have a, you're going to have a, a, a set of tools on the right hand side. And if you want to look at the new map viewer beta, it's, it's online. You're going to have tools over here. The measure tool. Okay. I want to, I want a measure tool. I want to look at, uh, I don't know, what's my location right here. Okay. So 32 North 81 West. Okay. In the, at the, after the first of the year, the measure tool won't be up there anymore. No big deal. You'll have a measure tool. You will have analytical tools like overlay and buffer. They won't be in the same location, but no big deal. Again, it'll be faster. It'll be using the new JavaScript API. It'll be more um, uh, performant. It will have additional tools and additional um, analytical tools in it as well. So that's good news. But don't get locked into thinking that it's got to be right here. And for you professors out there that you're screenshotting stuff, you know, in your lessons, I just would recommend also for you, as I do for myself, I'm not recommending, you know, you do anything that I'm not grappling with as well. But don't do that. Don't screenshot all that stuff that you had to in the past. In the past, that's all the students had. So you had to do that. You had to make these long lessons because there was no how to geocode video or the help files weren't all that good. So you had to put a lot of that in your actual lessons to students. But in the future, I would just argue even now, you really don't need to do that. Uh, and also I've found that the, uh, um, the students largely skip over my long lessons anyway. They get to the, par the parts for that they have, to, they have to do some work in because they know that, okay, if I don't know how to do this step in the lesson, I don't need to read all those screenshots. I can figure it out, it's pretty intuitive. Or if I really get stuck, I can go out to these other resources. So that's another thing I wanted to share. Um, I also wanted to share this, and this touches on what we talked about earlier, and that is being you know, having this holistic view. Yes, develop your skills in communication, geotechnology, statistics, coding, et cetera, but also your content knowledge is important. Oftentimes people say, um, you know, you GIS people, Joseph and Dr. Wei and others, you're just teaching buttons. No, no, we're not teaching just how to push buttons. We're teaching how to problem solve with, with these tools. OK, so it's never been about just the tools. It's all about solving problems with the tools. So how do you nurture that part? Well, it can be multiple content areas, but let's say you're really passionate about walkable communities or geologic hazards or or weather and climate or or, you know, ocean acidification, whatever you're you know interested in. That's the, your content knowledge. And it can change over time. OK, so for me, you know, I love demography, but I also love uh, hydrology and river systems and biomes. And I love education, which kind of ties them all together for me. 
But the geographic perspective on the left side too, even if you're a hydrologist or an oceanographer or a city planner, the geographic perspective doesn't just mean that you're in geography. In fact, there are more and more people, as I indicated earlier, that come into geospatial technology that have no geography background at all. And that's fine. As long as they don't neglect that geographic perspective, that holistic perspective that looks at how things are connected, how systems are connected, the carbon cycle, the, the weather cycle, the hydrologic cycle, et cetera. Okay. Another thing that I have in this story map, I, I'm not going to go into right here because we're running out of time, but the workforce reports I've gotten here from the World Economic Forum and other sources, I think are, are pretty important for you students, especially to look at. And maybe even for you faculty to think about, okay, given these trends, where do we need to focus courses, programs, certificate programs, et cetera, degree programs in the future, knowing what what these reports are showing. And these, these reports are, are actually a pretty rigorous and, and research. So that's why I, went, I wanted to include these World Economic Forum ones in here. Another thing that I wanted to um, share with you is right here toward the end. And that is the five skills that I think are partnering with the library. I've got some other things in here, but let me just skip to this five skills that I believe are important for you as you move forward. First of all, I touched on this earlier, but being curious and asking questions, that's gonna lead you to be tenacious about, oh, I've gotta figure this out. I really wanna get this to work. So it's the geographic inquiry process, asking a geographic question, gathering data, uh, exploring the data, analyzing the data, and that might lead to additional questions along the way. That's good, but then acting on it. Okay, so you've, you've studied invasive species or water quality or a geologic hazard. Is there something you could do about it? Are there recommendations that you can make or a presentation you can make to some sort of agency about, about what you've discovered? And then, as I mentioned with the geospatial uh, spatial reserves data blog, work being able to work with data is so important in our modern world. It just is con going to continue to be ever more important as we get flooded with these IoT feeds and, and so on. And so take a look at those spatial reserves. And also in, embedded in there is the ethical implications of what you're doing. You've got a powerful tool in mapping at your fingertips here. And use it wisely because how you symbolize, how you classify, the projection that you use, et cetera, has an impact on, especially now that you can share this with the globe or at least with a lot of colleagues in a group in ArcGIS Online, for example how they're going to perceive your problem really is hinging in part at least on how you display the data. So think carefully about how you're communicating with the data. Um, also know your geographic and geotechnical foundations. All these things that I have listed here are important, I think. Now, sure, when I work with a school of business and I work with those location analytics students in supply chain or risk assessment or uh, target marketing, you know, ma business management, et cetera, okay, they want to map their competitors. They want to map consumer behavior, you know, who buys diet iced tea, who buys, uh, you know, lottery tickets, who, who drinks coffee, who commutes to work by bicycle. And, and they want to be able to make infographics and maps and uh, run reports and do drive times, do drive time buffers. And that's about it, you know, for the for the intro and the intermediate use. I don't front end all of that with no, no, you can't learn about the things that you really want to learn about because I'm going to front end all of this with let's discuss the Federal Geographic Data Committee and the metadata standards and all that stuff and map projections. You know, no, I don't do that. There's time to inject some of that. So sure, if they're doing a global study on some sort of product they want to market in far flung regions of the globe, I say, you know, the projection really does matter here. OK, and that's my little avenue of uh, discussion on projections. But I don't I don't feel that they need to know everything that you all need to know about geotechnologies. I want them to use it. And uh, sure, they're going to make some unwise decisions about colors or, you know, classification method at some point. But then that's when they can come to, you know, people like you in the community saying, how do I symbolize this again appropriately? Adaptability, go outside your comfort zone. It could be a disciplinary comfort zone. So at a conference, whether it's virtual or face-to-face, -face, go to something that's completely outside of your wheelhouse. I did that at a geography conference not too long ago. I went to the social work track. I learned a lot. I met some new people. I learned about their methods. I didn't know anything about that area before. And so uh, also, you students are probably, uh, uh, many of you have had international experience before, but 
for those of you that haven't, go international. People around the world need your skills. And there's lots of opportunities, and plus you'll meet new people. You'll you'll get to expand your horizons in so many ways. Uh, in my career, I've been uh, very uh, uh, fortunate to have had you know the kinds of jobs where I could go on work travel. So I mean, those some of those are just near and dear. Taught in the UAE, in Taiwan, Japan, Australia, you know, um, uh, Tunisia, Ke Kenya, uh, and so on. And those have just been wonderful experiences. Plus, I think it's important to get out in the field. I mean. You know, it's great to look at satellite images and static photos like this and look at your remote sensing imagery and so on and so forth. But um, just as one example, I mean, I looked at um, uh, images and, and map data for Costa Rica for a long time before I actually led a group of educators down there. And, you know, seeing the biodiversity, every square meter, there's like three kinds of frogs, you know, four kinds of flowers, etc. And it's, it, it, you can't get that impression by looking at the data. And you get some sense of it. But just those field experiences, I realize right now it's a very much of a challenge, but um, I would just encourage you to pursue those. And finally, good communications, being able to articulate why what you're doing matters is so important. And so just, just to close, folks, I, I, I truly believe in my heart of hearts that this decade is an exciting one for geotechnologies. And you have a key role there, Georgia Southern, and throughout your future of helping us achieve this sustainable, resilient planet that uh, we want to achieve. Um, you know, that the goal is that wise decisions will be made with a spatial perspective to build this more resilient, happier, healthier future. Don't get discouraged, folks. I mean, think about Jon Snow and the cholera epidemic, you know, from 1854, which is in just about every geography textbook known to humankind. And I've got a GIS-based lesson uh, on that, and a variety of other people do as well. But when it drawn, dawned on people that, oh, okay, we're polluting our own water supply, we need to do something about it, that's a huge daunting task. What if they would have said, sorry, it's just too big of a problem, we can't handle it? Well, I realize that the UN Sustainable Development Goals, clean water for all is still on there, right? So we don't, we haven't achieved that. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna pretend that we have for the whole planet. It's still a very serious issue. But for many people, that issue was grappled with and resolved. So I just don't want you to lose heart. Think about, yeah, we've got some complex issues on our planet today, but you students are good people and you're thinking wisely and spatially and critically. And you've got some good mentor professors there. You've got some good data at your fingertips. You've got some wonderful tools. You've got this tool right here, which is the most important. So I'm confident that we're going to get there. So I just want to encourage you with those words. Um, questions, comments, issues. You can think about where this is. Thank you, Dr. Kersky, for this excellent uh, talk. And I know it's time. Um, but if you want to stay for a few minutes, I think Dr. Kursky can can be here for us and for Q and A, a short Q Q and A session. And let's give uh, Dr. Kursky a warm southern. Oh, you folks are the, the best. World. You're so kind. I appreciate it. Thanks, folks. Um, I, I wish you all the best. Yeah, but I'm happy to to take some questions here. Now I get, now I can see the chat box. I. Yeah, good question. Uh, very, very important one that I've gotten from many others. So it's, yeah, at some point, some universities had different policies, but I think it's, it's, it's wise for you to consider at some point not having access to your ArcGIS license there at Georgia Southern anymore. Uh, you know, some universities never delete student accounts and that's fine, but some do. And so I think it's wise for you to think about, first of all, your, your future organization is pretty likely to have some sort of ESRI technology because it's in just about every government agency and nonprofit organization, but there, there's, there's instances where it's not. And so what do you do then? Well, first of all, while you're still a student, I encourage you to go to the developer.arcgis.com developer site and get yourself a free account there. I have a um, account there as well. And this is where you can do a variety of things. You can make story maps, you can do some analysis. It's basically your own one person organizational subscription. So there's nobody else in the organization except you. And you can't geocode every water well in North America with it. You know, there's some limitations as to how much credit you can consume. But you can do some powerful things in there. And also, um, you can, through the tutorials that are on the developer site, as the name implies, it's also a way for you to learn some of the coding that goes behind these web maps and apps. So there's some uh, tutorials in uh, the JavaScript API and the Python, you know, the Jupyter Notebooks and things in there. But that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is 
and this and the developer account doesn't expire. The learn at ArcGIS.com, that is a library of lessons. And through that library of lessons, you can actually get a one year subscription in that in that um, learn.archgis.com. It's primarily for people that don't, you know, they're at a university that has no ESRI tech. So it really doesn't apply to you all, but it might be something, you know, if you're about ready to graduate that you might want to just go out there and get an account there. I think the developer one, which doesn't expire is actually better. There's also though a personal use license. It's a hundred dollars, but you get pro, you get community analyst, you get you probably have the um, capability of making hub, although I don't know off the top. But anyway, you get all the analytical tools, um, you know, so for less than, I don't know, Photoshop or, or Microsoft, I don't know what I paid last time I bought, you know, Office 365, but I think it was more than that. Anyway, you get a lot. Uh, so that's good. Um, it's kind of a last resort. So if you didn't have it in a, at your uh, organization, go there. But um yeah, so, okay, thanks, Munshi. Um, yeah, so, okay, I would say, uh, yeah, for those students that, you know, they're, they're, they're learning GIS, they have, I don't want to be a GIS person, Joseph. That's fine. And primarily, you know, my remarks here today were for those of you that, yeah, you want to be a planner or a wildlife biologist or, a, um, you know, a, a surveyor or, or something like that. You're going to be using geospatial technology. I mean, take a look at some of these job ads in those different professions and more. Their GIS is, is usually in most science-related and engineering-related jobs, and then oftentimes in business-related jobs. So I think you're wise to get some um, immersion in this. And I would start with what I was showing you earlier, and that is go to ArcGIS Online, make some maps, add some data, classify things, make, make some web apps, make a, make a story map. Um, and so on. You know, start there because he, this has about 40 analytical tools. ArcGIS Pro has 1,100 analytical tools. So start here with ArcGIS Online. And uh, that way you get, you know, sort of a dip into the shallow end of the geospatial swimming pool without getting sort of overwhelmed by, oh, wow, there's lots of different uh, capabilities in here. So I would, I would start um, with with this. And, and they're very um, engaging, you know, these maps. You know, there's, again, Find some layers that are really of interest to you. It may not be population like I showed, but it may be that wildfires layer. Maybe um, the, you know the, there's a, a, a layer. One of my favorite layers is the uh, World Hydro. So you've got different uh, levels of rivers and the flow of those rivers. So you can do trace downstream and you can look at watershed boundaries and maybe weather and climate is, is your thing. Um, there's also a, a variety of web mapping applications that are really engaging. For example, the Wayback imagery. And you can look at uh, you know your community over space and time with these apps, and they all do certain things. They do them very well. So if I go here to the wayback imagery, while your folks are thinking of other questions, and if I go to your community and take a look, hey, there's there's changes in the community, and can I figure out where those changes have happened? So you've got the 2014 and the 2020 imagery. Uh, you know, right here in the same um, uh, web mapping application. So you can look at changes over space and time. Let's take a look at this. So you right here, this this area right here on College and Bullock, Bullock Street, uh, you've got 2020, there is a parking lot and looks like there's some construction going on here. Um, and for more power, notice in the upper left, you can build a web map with the layers from the Wayback imagery. Why would you do that? Well, because this is an app. It's sort of like Lunchables. Do they still make those? You know, you get you get a, a Lunchable. It's 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 basically a thing at the grocery store, and uh, you get two carrots and two crackers and two pieces of cheese, and you know you can't modify it. It's, it comes in a package. This web mapping application is like a Lunchable. You can't modify it. It's got a certain number of layers of imagery, but if you go and do this choose versions from the list to build a set of wayback layers to use in a web map. That's like going to the produce section of the grocery store. Now you can customize. And then once you've got it in a web, in your own web map in ArcGIS Online, then you can add things to it. You could add ecoregions, population change, soil, 
moisture, et cetera, right? So you've got the best of both worlds. And that's what some of these web mapping applications allow you to do. They allow you to explore just for fun and looking at changes in over space and time. With this same tool, you can look at coastal erosion in England. You can look at glacial retreat. You can look at the construction of the Three Gorges Dam. You can do you know, rainforest analysis. You can do a lot. But then if you want to dig deeper, you, know, you could take the layers out into your own web map that you can use in ArcGIS Online or in ArcGIS Pro. That's just one of the things that I get excited about is that, oh my gosh, this is just one of dozens of these things that are super engaging. And uh, I would say uh, to, res to respond, um, am I paused on the screen share? Oh, sorry. I hope, I, I don't know how long that was paused, but uh, hopefully you're seeing this now. So you're seeing this, uh, what I was thought you were looking at before, but this building with the uh, changes in it uh, in your own community. So, Again, these, these applications are, are expanding and they're very engaging. And that's another way of getting, you know, keeping your interest uh, heightened in uh, geospatial technology. Cool. So, Joseph, I have some students on here that are not familiar with GIS. I'm going to assume they're from my World Regional course. Could you just give your short elevator speech about GIS for them and why it's cool and maybe consider you know, maybe I, taking a GIS course. At I love Southern, that you're teaching World Regional. I love World not. Regional. What's not to love? <laughs> Me too. I Very too. cool. Well, yeah, for you <laughs> in the World Regional, I mean, something like this way back imagery or the uh, world um, uh, water balance. Let me just show you that because you're on here. It's, from, it's part of the Living Atlas. And so this water balance app, let's say you're teaching about um, different climatic regions around the world. So you've got about six variables in the upper left here. And if you want to look at precipitation, let's say um, you've got, okay, let's, let's talk about, you know, it's not a wet season and a dry season, or it's a wet season and dry season. It's not summer or winter, right? So you've got this, you've got this seasonal change in precipitation, right? So you can see, oh gosh, you know, looks like October, November is the dry season and the wet season is like April, May fascinating and then i go up to southern libya and we've got whole years whole months of the year where there's absolutely no precipitation at all so again tying into the whole you know iot you're getting weather data soil moisture from these sources and then you can teach core concepts in world regional in environmental studies in engineering you know with these tools so that's what i love about these things that very you know the bell is going to ring students are going to come in i'm going to teach about these topics right now and here's a tool that i can do that so i love this kind of thing but i would say here folks this is this is my um okay my 30 second definition of geospatial technology and gis so here you've got um first of all a gis is not a bunch of uh, graphics floating out in cyberspace they are actually tied to a geo database the g part of the map is the map the G part of GIS is the map. It could be a satellite image. It could be an aerial photo. It could be a geologic set of layers for Georgia. The I part of GIS is what I was showing earlier. And that is behind the, the, the polygons or lines or points or images or grids is a database. So in this case, I've got a database of population variables, right? Demographic variables for every one of these polygons. In this case, I've got 217,000 polygons, which are the block groups of the USA. So the I part of GIS is the information of the database. The S part links them together. So if I clicked on this particular um, uh, block group, and if I said, hey, show, um, how about center on selection? So now I'm going to go over to Alabama, and now I'm going to look at that particular row is this location here in Alabama. Okay, so that it's linked. The G part and the I part are linked, and that's what gives us this power. So if I said, you know, I'm going to figure out uh, where I'm going to, you know, I was talking about the trace downstream tool. So I drop a hypothetical cup of water on a place that's uh, near Statesboro. Where does it flow? What direction does it flow? How does it know that? Because all of these things are spatially related and it's tied to a model of the earth. And one of those components of the model is the the relief or the elevation of the land. And so using those models, it can, it can figure out, okay, this is the, the, the trace for that cup of water. So all of these layers are spatially related in topology, topological relationships. And that's what I would say is, is really the essence of, of uh, geospatial technology and geographic information systems. Others might disagree and have a better definition. You know, traditionally the definition was, you know, hardware, software, people, algorithms, um, and, and data. Um, that's still a valid way of, of thinking about it, but I like to demonstrate it with, you know, this real example right here inside ArcGIS Online. Cool.
Great. Yeah, I'm glad you're teaching World Regional. All right, folks, we are probably out of time, and you probably have things to do. But again, um, remember, did anybody figure out where this was? You're thinking spatially now. Amy, you're not. You're not. Uh, Mexico? You're not allowed to answer. This is your teaching world regional. Is it in Mexico? There's a pyramid in the, on that, the image. It is. Um, yes. It is the southwest corner of North Dakota. North oh, Dakota. I know. Yep. So right where, you know, the, you're starting to see some breakup of the prairie and some, some landforms that are, you know, extending into Montana. But remember, I, I, I'm sincere about, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn or some other means, you know, I've got my Twitter posts and okay. They're pretty, they're pretty geo-focused. I, I must admit they're pretty geeky, but if you want to just get kind of a daily immersion, feel free to, to follow me there and check out some of those videos that I hope are helpful. But seriously, folks, I just wish you all the best. And um, I want to encourage you that this is indeed a very relevant, but also fun and engaging uh, tool for you as you move forward. And great. you've got some great expertise right there on campus. I mean, I'm just part of the, I'm just part of your network, but take advantage of those uh, good professors that you've got there. And I really am, am glad that you folks are thinking about, you know, the whole platform notion of GIS and really wanted to move this forward. Thank you, Dr. Kriske. Take care. Oh, you folks are the best. Thank Thanks you. a million. Thank so yeah, much. hope to see you see you on campus sometime soon. That would be a huge honor. Seriously, I'd love that. Let's let's actually let's we have we actually we have three campuses, so so we can have a little field trip. We, you know, can, I I noticed yeah. that when you probably saw me do that when I was up here in ArcGIS Online, and I and I did this, and it, yeah. and it uh, I had to choose. I had to choose because of the geocoding. Actually, was smart enough. Where it, when I saw this, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I don't know if the, if the third one is even on here, but uh, probably scrolling down, it probably would be. But yeah, I, I noticed that right when we were there. We're like, hmm, interesting. Yeah. Yep. So. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all right, folks. You. Take care. Yeah. Yep. We'll keep in, keep touch. in touch. All right. All, all best. All best wishes. Okay. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.